This video is sponsored by you and your generous support on Patreon. Patreon is the thing that keeps my work on this channel sustainable and allows me to try weirder, riskier stuff going forward. Plus you get access to cool exclusive content as well, so if you like my videos and want to directly help the channel continue so I can keep making more, head to patreon.com slash writing on games and pledge only what you're comfortable with. Thank you so much for your support and now on with the show. The trajectory of Gran Turismo over the years has been turbulent. I remember for a while there, it was considered the pinnacle of graphical fidelity in racing games of its time, showing a dedication to the craft of this then deep simulation that was unrivaled by its console counterparts, who favoured bombastic motorised mayhem over GT's more austere dignity. I remember that back then, it always felt like you were playing a game that knew how sleek it was. As the years went on though, the obsession that drove the development of these games translated to long gaps between releases, releases that, at least on a visual level, began to lag behind the greatly accelerating pace of the technology they were developed on. Racing games are typically the ones showcased as early graphical highlights of a new console. You know, shiny cars and convincingly wet roads look really good. Gran Turismo, on the other hand, from around the PS3 onwards, seemed to consistently find itself placed awkwardly late in the console cycle, with developer Polyphony Digital trying desperately to squeeze in a release or two before the move to the next generation and again failing to meet the kind of flash, the visual dazzle that was being seen in its contemporaries. And so Gran Turismo, once this untouchable powerhouse, over time seemed to slink into the position of weird curio, a potentially perilous situation if you look at it one way, where the developers are struggling to compete with the current landscape of racing games. But I don't know, after putting a whole bunch of hours into the upcoming Gran Turismo 7, the first GT release in five years and the first numbered instalment since 2013, what's become clear to me is that the series is more than comfortable with where it's at. Gran Turismo 7 isn't trying to compete with other racing games, it is its own beast entirely. An unwieldy, eccentric beast to be sure, one that might turn some players off from the get-go, but GT7 seems wholly unconcerned with that eventuality, showing from the minute you start the game that god, there really is no other series like Gran Turismo out there. And given how much I've come to enjoy, dare I say love my time with 7, I'd say it's all the better for it. I mean, forget the main menu, you see this X centricity from the moment you hit play game for the first time. Gran Turismo can't just have a single brightness adjust slider before getting into the game. No, you must confirm you are seated directly in front of your screen staring dead centre, and then carefully examine each of these patterns to adjust brightness, then darkness, then choose whether to prioritise frame rate or ray tracing, even though ray tracing isn't active during gameplay, then scroll through a number of photos to check that your brightness settings mesh well with the current exposure and saturation meters. You must then perform a lengthy musical minigame until finally Gran Turismo 7 deems you ready to play it. And look, that approach certainly has its problems, expediency is the major one, but also accessibility. It's impossible to know up front, for example, how any of this stuff is actually going to work before you're in game, at which point you find that the kind of assist settings that would provide a seamless, not too handholdy experience in something like Forza, here plaster the road in giant intrusive brake signs, you know, in the first hour or so there's a lot of fine tuning that needs to be done as you go here. But there's a part of me that also kind of loves this approach. It's precisely this eccentricity that has always made Gran Turismo such a unique experience. There's a reason these games come out once every 5 or 10 years, they're a different breed from your typical sim racer, and oddities like this, attention paid to the weirdest of details and the utterly unique way it's all communicated to you, highlights that after all this time, Polyphony Digital remains steadfast in their vision. This isn't solely about ensuring that your experience is as good as it can possibly be. No, they want to make sure you're the kind of player who will appreciate the borderline lunatic obsession that drove the creation of this game. At every single level, you've got to meet Gran Turismo 7 on its own terms. I mean, in order to do much racing here, you've still got to go through the brutal licensing tests that while providing interesting tense challenges in themselves, still leave me sweating after seven attempts of the one objective, gawking at my bronze award thinking, how could the game possibly expect me to do that? any faster. Hell, I didn't even unlock the menu option to access multiplayer until I was about 10 hours in. Sure, the game isn't forcing you to watch a bunch of separate movies explaining in extremely basic repetitive terms what sportsmanship means, as was the case in 2017's game Sport, a title I should add I never put any real time into myself outside of watching a few videos here and there, potentially rendering what I'm about to go into as a good deal less novel for you than it was for me, but that notion of carrying yourself with nobility in races is drilled into your skull 
all regardless. Hazard lights are automatically activated at the ends of races as if to say, this is the time when you calm down. Racing is no mere toy to be trifled with. <laughs> Gran Turismo 7 is that stern teacher you had at school that everyone was a little afraid of, where the resultant tension would cause someone to let out a slight giggle, only for said teacher to slam their hand on the desk and demand to know who dared sully the dignity of the classroom with their infantile guffawing. This is to be taken seriously, because indeed, as the opening movie illustrates with its schmaltzy music, its crediting of Lewis Hamilton as maestro, and images of races past juxtaposed with the Wright brothers and Einstein, Gran Turismo 7, more than any GT before it, treats the history of driving with an almost spiritual reverence, and the game demands, because of course you are the type of player who appreciates their vision, right, that you will share in that fervour. The game is structured entirely around doing a few race objectives here or there to collect cars as part of the menus you find at your Gran Turismo cafe hub, whereupon the owner Luca will treat you to a purely textual explanation of what makes this type of car the most special type of car ever made before you move on to the next also most special type of car ever made. It just so happens that the dignity with which Gran Turismo 7 treats the sport, the art of cars and racing, consistently butts up against one of the wildest presentations I've ever seen a game indulge in. That is to say, old Gran Turismo was sleek, 7 is anything but. You have these mental Euro Truck Sim-esque headshots explaining why FF is such an important concept in cars, trying to introduce characters whose sole purpose in life it would seem is to go, ooh, that's a nice sports car you've got parked outside this cafe, before you head to the museum, a feature that I just found out while editing was in fact in sport as well, sorry about that, where the release timeline of Gran Turismo games is placed against such hilariously baffling real world historical events. Like, did you know that Gran Turismo 1 released in 97? That's just a few short years after the Pope apologised for Galileo's excommunication for his belief in heliocentrism. If you can't tell, I genuinely love this dumb nonsense with all my heart. It's all played with the straightest of faces. There's such an earnestness to everything here that it becomes completely endearing. Hell, it even got me, a person who doesn't really know much about real world cars, pretty legitimately interested in the factoids being thrown my way. And despite it all being kind of nuts aesthetically, the cafe setup also happens to provide a really satisfying feeling of progression throughout your time with Gran Turismo 7. Coming off of something like Forza Horizon, which seeks to give you everything all at once in a desperate attempt to keep you happy, an approach that, don't get me wrong, absolutely works for what that game is, being encouraged instead to take your time and really get your bearings with a certain type of car before moving on to the next one is very cool. You do wonder how much of this is the result of microtransactions, and it sucks that I don't have any info pre-release to tell you how much credits cost or whatever, but I dunno, I was able to ignore that stuff well enough. I think by buying your way to the top, you're kind of spoiling the beauty of the game's core structure for yourself. On its own, Gran Turismo 7 makes you feel like you're earning every car you get. It inspires that glorious, just one more race, complete the set mentality, and illustrates just how versatile GT systems are between different classifications of vehicles, going way beyond increased speed alone. Moving from compact to rally to muscle cars might as well see you playing three entirely different games. And this is before we even get into the tuning and customization. One race, for example, saw my car just meeting the performance threshold to qualify, but I thought I would upgrade my vehicle with a bunch of enhancements, only to find that such improved performance required me to really grapple to master an entirely new beast. It is downright daunting how much flexibility is here, and the fact that such robust, completely serious driving systems are set against a backdrop of this tonal insanity makes them all the more fun personally. I mean, in general, I found myself resonating with the clunkier aspects of GT7 just as much as the mechanical polish in other areas. For example, reflecting the overall decline in visual luster that the series has endured over time, Gran Turismo 7, in comparison to other recently released racing games, still isn't quite the graphical powerhouse that one might expect from a flagship console racing title. It's not a bad looking game by any means, but when you look at other games out there, it definitely feels a little flat in the visual department sometimes. But I actually find it kind of charming honestly, at times the scenery in particular looks like it could have come straight out of a late PS3, early PS4 game and there's a fuzzy distant nostalgia in there that I can kind of appreciate, mirroring my limited but fond experience of Gran Turismo as a whole. But let me be clear, Gran Turismo 7 is still no slouch in the tech department, it's just that the tech being utilised isn't merely visual in nature. See, Gran Turismo 7 has the benefit of the dual sense, providing the kind of directional haptic feedback that has had me so consistently enamoured with the controller, but more importantly, making some of the best use of the adaptive triggers I've perhaps seen on the 
the PS5. With the sheer pushback you get through the L2 and R2 buttons as you race, you learn quickly, physically, that merely getting to top speed is only going to make it harder to break and regain control of your car. It speaks to the idea that, as evidenced by the albeit confusing song game they have you start out with, that there's a kind of musicality to the way that Gran Turismo controls. You begin to get the sense that the devs want you to treat the accelerator and brake the same way a virtuoso pianist might treat the sustain and dampen pedals, with extreme control, granularity and delicacy, almost never keeping either pressed down fully at any given time, precision and expression trumping sheer speed, with the haptics providing you a physicality that really requires you to get in touch with yourself as you play. Because sure, cars are technological things, and Gran Turismo knows and appreciates that, but perhaps more so than anything else, GT7 is about conveying the mindset of driving, of racing, that's less mechanical than you might think. Take the license test for example, a feature where simply adding an input map in the demonstrations you constantly get negged into watching by these dumb talking photographs might see these tests become more useful as a tutorial rather than merely gating progress, but nonetheless do aim to ease you into a more philosophical view of racing. You learn about distinct techniques, yes, but you also get told to take in your environment, train yourself to use visual indicators outside your car to intuit when you need to slow down for a turn, learn to visualise this series of complex corners as one larger manoeuvre so you can flow through it all more easily, less robotically. Because don't let what I've talked about so far detract from the fact that Gran Turismo remains a totally serious, absolutely incredible driving experience, one whose very real thrills are difficult to get across through footage alone. Gran Turismo 7 is not flashy, but it is remarkably tense, intense, in a way that I haven't experienced in a racing game in a long time. Hell, even words might not accurately describe how Gran Turismo 7 feels to play. It really is a game that you have to experience firsthand to understand the nuances of. It's certainly not arcadey, but it's also not quite totally simulative either, as much as its branding might have you thinking otherwise. Thanks to a decades-long reticence on the parts of either the developers or the frankly intimidating number of licensees here to have their cars be subject to anything other than light visual grazes here or there, heading into a wall is still going to send you careening like a pinball rather than causing actual wreckages. What is closer to simulative, however, is the way the game handles braking. You slam on the brakes here and it's not some shortcut to ridiculous drifts, but instead crushes your turning angle. Braking on the fly is not an option here. You really need to pay careful attention to your environment, not just the road directly in front of you, and prepare your maneuver well in advance of the corner itself, lest you fly right over it as if veering off course was your plan all along. And while I'm certain there's a point where this delicate process becomes second nature, calculated and removed of any chance whatsoever, for me, someone who likes racing games a whole lot but would never call myself actually good at them, in Gran Turismo 7 it always leads to such a delightful tension, where you prepare as best you can on your approach and then execute on the turn with fingers and toes crossed that you'll make it through unscathed. It's been a long long time since a game has gotten me so constantly, so instinctually leaning physically from left to right in my seat, trying to will my car round the bend. And whether this leads to you gliding around a corner in a way that looks totally effortless, despite the very prevalent aforementioned Herculean effort, or a nail-biting hug of the edge of the track, it never feels anything less than great to successfully round a corner. And every turn survived really lets you know that you're getting to grips with GT7's unique rhythm. Sure, when you fail, you fail big time. There's no rewind button here. But it is kind of refreshing, honestly, to play a game like Gran Turismo 7 in the modern racing game landscape where no such relief exists. This is a game that punishes even the slightest arrogance in a brutally cold manner. One corner can have you thinking you're the king of the goddamn world, but hell, even in the space of that same corner sometimes, the game can be ruthless in taking that away from you, with the caveat that it's always clear that you didn't get cheated out of anything. You've just got to manoeuvre better next lap. That's said, to expand on a previous point, once Gran Turismo 7 has gotten its hooks in you, once it has deemed you worthy of actually playing it, the game can move on to rewarding you for putting in that effort, and god is Gran Turismo 7 a rewarding gameplay experience. Every lap becomes a chance to optimise, in the same way you might do with runs in a Trackmania game, as nuts a comparison as that might sound, where the most seemingly insignificant, minuscule alterations to how you take a corner can pay untold dividends later on when that car you thought you'd never catch up to is now squarely in your sights. And that ebb and flow of tension truly lies within every corner in GT7, meaning that every race, every few seconds of game time even, is filled with these amazing
amazing fluctuations in dynamics. Every turn here is part of a story told through gameplay, one of self-improvement, of palpable risk and dazzling reward. And you know, after a while, even the crazy set dressing would inform these stories. I'd find myself gradually get into the habit of clicking the little heads below the race options, what I assume to be prominent figures in the Gran Turismo scene or developers, because I knew what I'd find down there would be completely hilariously absurd. Getting told about some random dude's favourite thrash bands or some equally random dude's signature hat, only to see certain faces popping up that I recognise. Wait a minute, that's the prick who was telling me how shite I was doing in the licence tests and telling me to go back and watch the demonstration I'd already watched. Plus, he's actually in the upcoming race. And let me tell you, combined with the gut-wrenching tension of the corner-to-corner -corner racing, there was something surprisingly glorious to seeing that dude miles ahead think, I'll never catch up to him, he's just too good, only to use skill and precision to overtake him at the very last corner and cruise my way to first place. In short, how this stuff is presented might be totally insane, but the way it all comes together results in a surprisingly coherent, engaging and abundantly rewarding gameplay experience. More so than the cars you get at the end of a race, or the game's technical prowess that still lags behind more contemporary titles, or the daft roulette spins, or the wild and wacky stuff they cram in to structure your experience, it's testament to just how enduring the GT formula is that this moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is where the real beauty of Gran Turismo 7 is to be found. While it may be difficult for some to break past the walls it puts up around itself, I personally couldn't be happier that there remains no other series quite like Gran Turismo. Thank you all so much for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, turn on notifications, all that YouTube stuff, and check my podcast and Twitch links in the description. Most of all though, I have to thank my patrons for their unbelievably generous support. I'm currently researching a larger, riskier piece on Yakuza Cinema and the lessons that the Yakuza games might have taken from that, for instance, and I simply would not be able to consider those kinds of ideas were it not for the safety net your continued support gives me. Thank you all so much. If you've enjoyed any of the videos I've put out and want to join the many amazing people on screen helping the channel become more sustainable by supporting Supporting my work, you can directly help out as well as get things like access to completely ad-free video uploads, Q&As, and now exclusive video content by heading to patreon.com slash writing on games and pledging only what you feel comfortable with. I am forever thankful for your support in whatever form it takes. Special thanks go to Mark B. Writing, Artyom Vitsyuk, Ben O'Sullivan, Charles J. Liu, Dan Murray, Gavin Casey, Alistair Dunn, Vitautis Catarsis, Matthew Bowman, Ben Pace, David Carstens, New Static, Mike G, Tom Webster, Max Cohen, Dana Sikowskis, Christopher Faraty, Nicholas Villeneuve, Nelwyn Palacios, Ruth Natman, Yogesh Despande, Lea Cinello, Captain Knusprich, Bryce Snyder, Lucas, David Bjork, Winter, Timothy Jones, Matthew Grover, The Nameless Guy, Tommy Carver Chaplin, Dr. Motorcycle, Shardfire, Lynn Browning, Calliope Rannis, Vila Nermi, Spike Jones, Dallas Keen, Charlie Kimball, Jordan Midler, and Charlie Yang. And with that, this has been another episode of Writing on Games. Thank you all so much for watching, stay safe, and I will see you all next time. We'll see you.